Hello, everyone. I'm Carmel Shachar, the Petrie Flom Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics at Harvard Law School's Executive Director. I'm here to welcome you to Psychedelics in the Global North, which is the first of a three-part panel, Psychedelics Around the World, which we are producing in partnership with the RAND Drug Policy Research Center. So thank you to our RAND folks. I think this is a great kickoff to understand what countries around the world are doing when it comes to saying, okay, maybe pure criminalization of psychedelics is too much of a heavy hand, but what does a reasoned, well thought out approach to psychedelics look like from a regulatory or legal perspective? Before we get into the substance, a few housekeeping remarks. First of all, we will be reserving time for a moderated Q&A with our panelists. So we not only allow, in fact, we strongly encourage you to submit questions that our moderator can pose to the panelists. Please submit questions at any time, not just during the Q&A, using the Q&A feature found in the meeting control at the bottom of your screen. That's the best way to make sure we see your question. You can also join the conversation or submit questions on Twitter we're at Petri Flom. Again, that's at Petri Flom. We will be sharing the fully captioned event video with all registrants, so you and other people have registered within one to two weeks. Please feel free to share that link with family, friends, anybody who you think would find this presentation interesting. If you have any technical issues, and I hope you won't, please email petri-flom at law.harvard.edu and we'll do our best to help get things straightened out. If you're interested in this event and you like what we do, I strongly recommend that you sign up for our newsletter. There's a QR code, but you can also go to our website. The newsletter comes out only twice a month, so it will not clog your inbox, and it's by far the best way to find out about research initiatives, scholarship, events, digital conversations that we're hosting. Speaking of digital conversations, I would also encourage you to check out our blog, Bill of Health. There we have a host of scholars, industry leaders, translate some really cutting edge, complex health law and policy and bioethics issues into accessible, short, punchy pieces. I know we've covered a lot of psychedelics on the blog. Also check out our upcoming events. As I mentioned, this is the first of three events. The next one will be Psychedelics in the Global South. And then we'll have psychedelics and indigenous communities. So I do hope to see you there. Also, as I mentioned, this event is co-sponsored. And to learn more about the RAND Drug Policy Research Center, please check out their website. We've put the URL on the slide. Speaking of our RAND collaborators, we are lucky enough to have Bo Kilmer, who is the Macaulay Chair in Drug Policy Innovation, and co-director of the RAND Drug Policy Research Center, as well as senior policy researcher at the RAND Corporation today to serve as moderator. Bo, I would like to hand it over to you. Great, thank you, Carmel. And I wanna thank all of you for being here and then you know, joining this important conversation. We've got four fantastic speakers and uh, they're gonna be speaking in alphabetical order. So I will introduce each one and they will speak for about 15 minutes. And then after about an hour, uh, we will get into the moderated Q&A. So as Carmel said, uh, if you have any questions at any point, uh, please put them into the, uh, uh, the Q&A box. Uh, we're gonna start off with Dr. Wayne Hall, who is an emeritus professor at the National Center for Youth Substance Use Research at the University of Queensland. And he also serves as a fellow at both the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia and the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences. Dr. Hall. Well, thanks, Bo. Thanks for the introduction. Um, thanks for the invitation to speak. Uh, my topic today is going to be what's going on in Australia around uh, psychedelic drugs, particularly uh, and the therapeutic use, not so much the issues around uh, non-medical use because it's still a uh, criminal offence uh, to use these drugs without uh, a prescription, or it will be. Declaration of interest, I don't have any financial interest in any pharmaceutical companies or products, and I don't hold any patents on drugs or devices, but I have been paid to assess applications for public subsidies of pharmaceutical drugs to the Australian uh, government uh, back a decade or more ago, 
and I've more recently advised the Australian Drug Regulator, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, on evidence around the efficacy of medical cannabis. And uh, I've been an advisor to the World Health Organization on the adverse health effects of cannabis. Uh, sorry. A bit of background, I guess the, where I'm coming from in terms of personal experiences is, is relevant here and understanding the, the views that I'm about to express. Uh, I guess I'm chronologically gifted enough to have been around in Australia in the early 1970s when we had uh, a major romance with the psychedelic drugs for non-medical purposes and certainly saw plenty of intelligent peers who used these drugs and ended up following some fairly dubious uh, gurus such as uh, Babaram Das, Carlos Castaneda and uh, the Bhagwan. I'm also old enough to remember earlier enthusiasms for drugs in psychiatry, the benzodiazepines in the 1980s, the SSRI antidepressants and atypical antipsychotics in the 1990s. All of these drugs were claimed to be transformative. Uh, they certainly proved better than the drugs that they replaced, but they also proved to be less effective and widely used. And they also turned out to have adverse effects, unsurprisingly. So that's the sort of background that I bring to it. And I guess in terms of why I got interested in the topic more recently, or Michael Pollan's book, uh, has, has probably had a big impact on public understanding and interest in uh, psychedelic drugs. Uh, I read that um, just before COVID descended and ended up spending a lot of time during COVID reading uh, a lot of the, the very interesting historical scholarship on the early research on LSD and alcohol dependence uh, in Saskatchewan. Uh, so that's sort of, I guess, by way of background. I've also spent a lot of time reading uh, the more recent clinical research, which David Nutt has taken a leading role in, the uh, randomized controlled trials that have been conducted, uh, psilocybin and, and MDMA, the, the MDMA in the US. And the, the results have been quite surprising, uh, I guess, in terms of how positive they are. The major limitation has been that until very recently, the funding for these has largely been philanthropic. So trials have been reasonably small. They have largely been conducted by people who are committed to introducing these drugs into clinical practice. And until very recently, there's been very little pharmaceutical industry interest or governments investing in funding research in this area. And in the past, I've advocated for government funding of clinical trials on these drugs. And the Australian government several years ago, in fact, uh, has set aside 15 million Australian dollars for the conduct of these sorts of clinical trials. David will talk about the, this research in detail, so I won't go into any of this. And there's clearly a lot still to be learned about the mechanisms of treatment um, and the role that spiritual experiences play in the therapeutic efficacy of these drugs. But it's also clear, I think, that even if we discount the positive findings by 50%, um, there's still a very strong case to be made for doing large clinical trials, particularly in more representative patient samples than we've seen in the trials to date. And we clearly need a lot more funding of research to better understand the neuropharmacology of these very interesting drugs and, and to understand the mechanisms and, and the role played by psychotherapy. And from the point of view of someone involved in public uh, well, decisions about public subsidy of treatment, the model that's been developed and trialed in these trials is a very expensive Rolls-Royce model of uh, psychotherapy. Uh, and as we'll see in Australia, the, the price that's been quoted for providing this in the private sector at the moment is in the order of 15,000 US dollars. So it's not a cheap sort of treatment. So the regulatory situation in Australia is probably of interest. Uh, this has uh, changed fairly radically very recently, February this year. The Australian Drug Regulator, the Therapeutic Goods Administration decided to allow the use of MDMA and uh, psilocybin uh, for PTSD and depression respectively, uh, that they could be prescribed as unapproved drugs um, by prescribers who had to be psychiatrists and who had to uh, be approved prescribers, and I'll explain what that means in a moment, uh, and to operate under the ethical oversight of uh, an ethics committee uh, to conduct this work. This uh, decision was made under the special access provisions of the Therapeutic Goods Act. This is legislation that goes back to the 90s that was prompted by the advocacy of 
uh, HIV AIDS advocates uh, back at that time to allow patients to get earlier access to unapproved medicines, uh, particularly patients with serious illnesses. Uh, and these were the intention was this would provide early access to drugs that were either undergoing clinical trials or had been approved in another country but were not yet not available in Australia, possibly because the company didn't see the, the pharmaceutical company didn't uh, see a, a large enough market to justify uh, bringing the drug in. So that was the intention, and, and this act allows, uh, under the most liberal provisions, that any uh, physician or medical practitioner is allowed to prescribe an unapproved medicine to a, a named individual patient after obtaining approval from the regulator. Uh, that's not allowed under the decision that's been made on psychedelics uh, at the moment. The second pathway is an authorised prescriber, and this is a person who's been recognised by the TGA as having relevant expertise in the uh, diagnosis and treatment of a particular condition. Uh, and they can treat uh, large or larger numbers of patients without having to uh, obtain approval after each individual patient. Uh, but they do need to notify the Therapeutic Goods Administration that they've done so after the fact. I think it's within six months of uh, prescribing these drugs. And they're also required to report any adverse uh, events. So that's the, the provisions under which it, it's been allowed. Um, this decision came as a bit of a shock, both to the people who were campaigning for it and to many people in the field. Um, and, and the reasons for that were several. One, that it was contrary to the advice of the TGA's own expert uh, committee that reviewed the evidence, uh, recommended against uh, this um, application from uh, a group, My Medicine Australia, uh, a charity, a, a non-government, not-for-profit organisation. It was also opposed by the College of Psychiatrists and the Australian Psychological Society. Uh, not that they were opposed to the use of these drugs, but the, the argument was it was too soon to be allowing them into uh, clinical practice, albeit uh, as unapproved uh, therapeutic goods. What brought it about? Uh, David Nutt, as you'll hear, uh, had a lot to do with it. He made a, a lecture tour of Australia shortly before it, which is uh, credited with bringing about the change of heart on the part of the TGA, which uh, I should say uh, had put out an interim decision which uh, had indicated that it was going not going to approve uh, this use of psychedelics. There was also an intensive advocacy campaign that was directed at uh, ministers in uh, federal and state governments and key policymakers. Um, and this was run by an advocacy group that uh, is, has also been uh, training large numbers of uh, psychedelic uh, assisted psychotherapists. And the concern for a lot of people who were a bit shocked by this was the, the precedent that it creates for similar, similar advocacy campaigns to bring pressure to bear on the regulator. Uh, it certainly was pretty much uh, the way in which medical cannabis was introduced in Australia. And it has proven uh, very much similar parallels with the FDA's decisions recently to approve Alzheimer's drugs. Uh, in the face of, or contrary to expert opinion and in, uh, in the face of uh, concerted advocacy by patient groups. So I guess the concerns uh, about the future of this um, decision is that the recommendations or the conditions under which the TGA has, uh, has agreed to allow the use of uh, these drugs uh, as unapproved therapeutic goods pretty restrictive. So it's only psychiatrists uh, who can be authorised prescribers, and it's not clear how many of them will put their hand up to, uh, to become uh, authorised prescribers. It's limited to the, the drug psilocybin and MDMA uh, for the moment, and, and to patients with major depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. And the prescriber has to obtain ethics committee approval for, for their use and there has to be some sort of ethics committee uh, oversight of the process. Uh, the details on how that's going to work are yet to be sorted out. This is not to be introduced until the 1st of July, so it's still a bit unclear how this will operate in practice. It's almost certain, I think, that the advocates will campaign to loosen these conditions because it will clearly be very difficult for patients to access these treatments uh, you know, if there's a, only a handful of psychiatrists who uh, agree to uh, become approved prescribers. And there's a very large for-profit sector out there itching to 
uh, get into the business of providing psychedelic psychotherapy in private hospitals and treatment centers. Uh, and the extent to which that happens, then we may well have quite serious problems, I think, in maintaining the quality of delivery of this treatment uh, when it gets out into, if it gets out into the wild. And as I've already mentioned, the, the concern has already been expressed about the likely costs that will be uh, uh, charged for this treatment in the private sector of the order of about 15,000 US dollars uh, for, a, for a course of, of this treatment. So we can expect to see, as we already have for medical cannabis, demands for public subsidy of treatment costs. So a combination of libertarian drug regulation with socialized medicine that so we seem to specialize here in Australia. I guess the other concern that I have given the history I mentioned earlier is the, the likely premature rush to clinical adoption and commercialization in particular of this treatment if, if those uh, concerns about uh, liberalizing access do come about and we see uh, a very uh, rapid escalation of uh, involvement of the private sector, for-profit private sector. There's also concerns, I think, about the heightened suggestibility that the patients experience during and after the use of these drugs. And I noticed that uh, Matthew uh, Johnson and others have been talking about the guru temptation on the part of therapists that uh, one would have to manage uh, if these drugs become widely used. Uh, so I guess the concern that some of us have about the decision that the PGA has made is that we you know, are at risk, but if it becomes much more liberal than it currently is at the moment, then we'll risk uh, provoking, promote, provoking some of the public backlash we've seen in the past if we have some cowboy therapists out there operating in, in ways that uh, cause harm to, to individuals. I'll finish there, and I, I think Bo uh, mentioned earlier that I have published some papers on, on this topic and uh, at greater length that elaborate on the views I've just discussed, and they can be provided to participants later uh, who are interested. So I'll finish there to allow Great. plenty of time for other presentations and for questions afterwards. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hall. Um, next up, we have uh, Dr. Pamela Crisco who is a medical doctor and a clinical instructor at the University of British Columbia. And she is also uh, the found, or a founding board member of the Canadian Psychedelic Association and the medical lead for the Roots to Thrive program. Dr. Crisco, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Bo. Wonderful to be here. In fact, what I'll do is I'll start out by actually going through all my conflicts and biases because as a medical doctor, I certainly carry a lot of biases. So I'm a medical, Canadian medical doctor with expertise in chronic pain and psychedelic medicine. Um, as mentioned, I'm on the Roots to Thrive research team uh, where we have uh, clinical trial protocols progressing on ketamine, psilocybin, MDMA, and chronic pain. I'm one of the co-investigators on the microdose.me study, which has 24,000 people enrolled on um, microdosing psychedelics. Uh, mentioned I have academic appointments at Vancouver Island University and the University of British Columbia. And I'm the medical chair on the Vancouver Island University Postgraduate Certificate in Psychedelic Assisted Therapy. And I have some volunteer advisory positions with Nectera. I'm a clinical advisor to Numinous and I'm a scientific advisor and co-founder of Micromedica Life Sciences. And before medicine took over my life, I, had, I received a criminology degree. I was a forestry firefighter for four seasons and a city firefighter for eight years. So I'm going to run through what has been going on in Canada for the last little bit. So historically, you know, Canada had a, a well chronicled um, use of psychedelics um, in the Western modalities. Um, Dr. Erica Dick is actually the expert, expert on that, and she has published a number of books, which I'll leave to the viewers to check out if they want to see some of the, the history of psychedelics in Canada prior to the war on drugs. And those are Managing Madness, Weyburn Mental Hospital, and the Transfor Transformation of Psychiatric Care in Canada. And her other book is uh, Psychedelic Psychiatry, LSD on the Canadian Prairies. Um, we also have a, a pretty troubled history related to the CIA's projects for mind control with MK Ultra that took place in McGill in Montreal from 1957 to 1964, and that all being just before, before the war on drugs. 
Um, Canada also has a very strong First Nations uh, population and First Nations history. And so, of course, there would have been an experience with non-ordinary states with the First Nations peoples of Canada, and that's not my area of expertise at all, so I won't delve into that. But there were well-documented exchanges of peyote use in the plains of Canada, so from the, the peyote people in, in central and our southern US and uh, in the middle of Canada, there was some documented cultural exchanges on it. So in the modern time now, and again, my bias is mostly speaking about Western, the Western approach to these medicines. So we've seen these medicines emerging back into Canada um, around about 2017 when Dr. Bruce Tobin, a therapist, applied for what we call a section 56 exemption to the health minister the federal health minister of Canada, for one of his patients, um, Thomas Hartle, who had a cancer, a stage four palliative cancer diagnosis. And that application was essentially ignored for about three years and then denied. And then with enough public outcry, it was actually accepted. And that became a historical first legal psilocybin mushroom session in Canada since the 1970s. And I just wanna let the viewers know that I know from, our, from around the world, Canada has a federal healthcare system, so that means um, if something is legal or mandated by the, the Health Act to be um, a legal therapy, it, if, it's, if it's mandated federally, then it is legal across the country. So we have provinces in Canada, and the provinces don't have to say, yes, we agree. Once it's federally legal, it's legal across Canada. So the provinces can't make a different decision than the federal health minister. So after we got the first legal uh, section 56 exemption, um, there was of course a flood of applications. The team I'm on, the nonprofit therapy team, Roots to Thrive, that I am the medical lead of, we received 17 of them and were able to bring 17 people with end of life diagnoses through legal psilocybin mushroom therapies in, um, in Canada. And that was quite a privilege to be part of that. Then Health Canada changed that access, the Section 56 access, and moved us towards what was called the, is called the Special Access Program. So the differences between these options was in the Section 56 exemption, the patient could make their application directly to the federal health minister with the support of a medical health professional, like a therapist or a physician. And so they, and then the patient procured their own medicine, so their own mushrooms. Um, so the doctor wasn't involved in that and Health Canada wasn't involved in that. So they could grow their own psilocybin mushrooms and that could be used in their therapy. I do the special access program that changes it to where the, the physician has to make the application to uh, Health Canada. And we have to fill in the form and we have to provide all the, lit the literature review, all the data that supports the use of that psychedelic medicine and it's indication that the patient is asking for. So all the data around, for instance, treatment resistant depression or existential distress, and then also make, um, make and also then be able to show that um, we can actually get access to that medicine. So there has to, has to be a supplier in Canada that can actually supply either the psilocybin or MDMA, whatever is on the special access. So that means that one of those companies has had to have brought those medicines through phase one and phase two. And then the physician is in charge of uh, providing the therapeutic session with the patient if the SAP uh, special access program, short form SAP is granted. And that has shifted again for us in that Health Canada has told us that they want us to move all these applications into clinical trials. So now we are moving all of our applications into open label clinical trials, which are essentially treatment trials. So the patient, there's no placebo arm, the patient is in the active treatment if, if they get, if they have meet all the inclusion and exclusion criteria of the program. And so that's where we're moving. So the legal framework in Canada is, um, you know, these medicines are schedule three in Canada. So they are neat. Um, we don't have access to them as, as legal medicines without going through the application processes through Health Canada. We have a number of cities in Canada that have decriminalized uh, psilocybin, including Vancouver and Kingston. And in the in decriminalization, it essentially means that this is the lowest police 
priority. So they police have cannot put any resources to um, to enforcing uh, these medicines as illegal unless they have done everything else. So there are actual storefronts selling uh, psilocybin uh, mushrooms and products in Vancouver and Kingston and other places across Canada. In British Columbia, the province that I'm in, we've actually decriminalized MDMA this year. And this is a harm reduction approach. And, and BC has a long history in Canada of leading drug policy. It was the center of harm reduction, of the four pillar approach, um, having the first legal safe injection sites in Canada. In fact, uh, BC went to the federal Supreme Court to fight for this right to be able to provide safety for safe injection sites. And it saved the healthcare system millions of dollars by preventing HIV and hepatitis C infections. So, and the, the other part is, is there's a strong recognition, especially in British Columbia, and I think across Canada, that uh, drug use is really a health care issue and a health care treatment and not a criminal or a policing issue. So we see that really, really moving quite quickly across Canada. Clinical trials in Canada are flourishing. Um, we've recently had the federal government um, provide funding, so a CIMH funding through uh, $5 million for public research for psilocybin therapy. So that was a first in Canada, and that's pretty exciting to have that public re public research funded. And there are across Canada, um, for in just in psilocybin alone, already registered trials for uh, depression, eating disorders, couple therapy, fibromyalgia, PTSD, provider excellence, end of life, opioid use, alcohol use, and mood enhancement in clinical trials registered around MDMA for fibromyalgia, couples therapy, and PTSD. The research institutes that are leading the way on this is uh, the BC, the British Columbia Center for Substance Use has been leading a lot of the research since 2017. There's been another research institute on Vancouver Island, the Nasa Mawat Center for Psychedelic Research, which is a very interesting collaborative between First Nations and Western uh, medicine uh, working together. In fact, it is the phrase that Nasa Mawat Center uh, me is a Coast Salish word meaning working together as one mind and spirit. And so what we will find is that there will be an integrative way of, of looking at uh, generating research and science around these medicines that also honor Indigenous ways of knowing and the First Peoples of Canada. There's research institutes in, on the, in Centre Canada, uh, in Ontario at the Michener Institute, and the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health in Ontario since the late 1970s. The academic programs are filling in the gaps as well. So the Vancouver Island University Postgraduate Certificate in Psychedelic Assisted Therapy was launched last year uh, with overflowing applications and, and again this year. The University of Ottawa has a master's program in psychedelic and spiritual studies. And there are other many, many other um, programs that are coming. And I, I'm sure that we'll expect to see a psychedelic program in every university that has a medical uh, school and a psychiatric uh, residency. We'll see that. Therapy is being provided across Canada in private practice um, and in uh, not-for-profit organizations. And they have access right now in the psychedelic realm with ketamine and psilocybin and MDMA. And finally, moving into policy and what's happening. So like I said earlier, there um, all these medicines right now are in Schedule 3 in Canada. So we need special permission from Health Canada to work with these medicines or use them in therapeutic modalities. There is a Supreme Court, or no, it's not there yet, but there is a, a, a charter challenge against the government of Canada and the Minister of Health right now regarding patient access to psilocybin and psilocybin therapy. Eight Canadians have launched um, a, a charter challenge uh, saying that access, need, that, that the health minister denying some of the applications um, is a violation of their Section 7 uh, rights, which guarantee the rights to life, liberty, and security of the person. Across Canada, our, our opinion polls, a Nanos poll uh, last year and another one this year, uh, replicated the same results that approximately 
of Canadian support, the use of psilocybin, especially in people that have an end of life diagnosis. And right now there is a federal e-petition that has been launched by the Psychedelic Association of Canada that um, is, is saying that in Canada, we federally have medical assistance in dying called MAID, M-A-I-D, medical assistance in dying. And that e-petition is saying that if people, if a Canadian qualifies for medical assistance in dying, then they must automatically qualify for psilocybin if they wish it. So that federal leap petition is going in and it closes in about uh, two weeks or more. Hoping that we'll get about a half million signatures from Canadians coast to coast. So closing up, there's um, widespread support in um, consistently in opinion polls by Canadians for at least access to psilocybin. There's plenty of clinical trials going uh, coast to coast with MDMA and psilocybin. And um, therapy is in process across Canada with both of these. And um, I think we're going to see some really robust work and collaborations. Back to you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Crisco. Uh, so we've done Australia. Uh, we've done Canada. Uh, now it's time to move to Europe. Uh, but before I introduce our next speakers, I just want to remind everyone uh, that if you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A. We'll get to them after our uh, final speaker. Uh, but next up, we have Dr. David Nutt, who is the director of the Neuropsychopharmacology Unit uh, in the Division of Brain Sciences at Imperial College uh, London. And he also serves as the chair of drug science and the president of the European Brain Council. Dr. Nutt, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's great to be talking to you. It's, um, on the other hand, it's rather sad to be talking to you and telling you about this current status of... Um, of reason and progress in the UK. Today, our government reached a complete nadir in drug policy. Today, it banned nitrous oxide on the grounds that young people were using it and leaving the uh, canisters on the, on the floor and causing litter. And, uh, and so we have chosen to criminalize young people just because they litter. And that, I have to say, is uh, perhaps surprising to you. To me, it's not so surprising because just a, two months ago, our Home Secretary, who controls the drug laws, was recommending that we should categorize cannabis alongside crystal meth and crack cocaine as the most harmful drug. So we're in an extraordinary, bizarre situation where we are, we are behaving much more like Russia and China than a relatively liberal Western democracy. And I won't spend any more time going into why that is, but uh, it's a lot of it is due to the fact that uh, we're not even a democracy anymore. But let's put that to one side. Let's look at psychedelics. So um, as you probably know, we've done quite a lot of work, research on psychedelics in the UK, largely out of my group. But one thing you may not know, and although, some of you will know that I've spent a lot of time working in the policy arena and doing assessments of drug harms. I was, I was the drug czar in Britain for a while until I was sacked for uh, arguing that uh, ecstasy was less harmful than horse riding. Uh, I, uh, I'm largely a brain scientist and a researcher. And uh, when I started off working with psychedelics about 15 years ago, I had zero interest in making them medicines. The reason I did the experiments was because up to that, by that point, I had studied the brain effects of pretty much every other drug you can name of, certainly or every other class of illegal drug. And I thought, well, before I die, it would be sensible to do psychedelics because no one else was doing it because it was too difficult because they were controlled drugs, schedule one, class A drugs. So um, I decided to, um, Put my neck on the line it got chopped off once but i got sacked by the government but but we persisted and um and during that the, the next last 10 years we have done a whole series of brain imaging experiments on psilocybin on mdma on lsd on D, dmt dimethyltryptamine those are all published if the last one came out last week which is the most beautiful imaging study we've ever done a, a study using both fMRI and EEG simultaneously to explore the mechanisms of a DMT trip. And we've got unpublished data now on 5-methoxy DMT as well. Uh, we've also done quite a bit of work on ketamine. 
And we're planning to do Ibogaine when we can get a safe version. And it, what we've shown from those brain imaging studies is that all these drugs do the same thing. But they all do some, which is a rather interesting thing. They all fragment rhythmic brain activity. They put the brain into a state of considerable disorganization, which we call the entropic brain. And you can measure it using statistical uh, approaches of complexity. And the more complex the brain under a trip, the bigger the effects. And, uh, and as we've recently shown, the more complex, the better the therapeutic outcome. But I'll come back to that in a minute. But what was remarkable about those imaging studies was it were two things. The first is that areas of the brain that we know drive depression, like the subgenual cingulate cortex, were powerfully disrupted by psychedelics. And also the network of the brain, which encodes self-referential thinking, including negative thinking and depression, the, the so-called default mode network, that was also profoundly disrupted. And when we first published the first published paper on that in 2012, just a few months before, a group at Yale had published a paper showing that the default mode network was overactive in depression, which makes sense because depression is a disorder in which people get locked into ruminative thinking loops from which they can't escape. And those are encoded in the default mode network. And so we reasoned if we could switch off the subgenual and if we could disrupt the default mode, we might actually do something to depression so our studies in depression all came from the brain imaging work. Uh, it was a hypothesis uh, generated um, from imaging. And so it was a rather classic example of translational medicine. And even more remarkably, it worked. And uh, the first study was a, a single trip with psilocybin. In people with treatment-resistant depression, they'd failed on at least two antidepressants. Some had failed on 10 or more. They'd all failed on psychotherapy and pretty much all got better. And some are still well today, 10 years later. The vast majority, the depression crept back. But for the first three to six months, the mean depression scores were reduced. And that was the most powerful single dose treatment of resistant depression that has ever been. And it really excited the field. So that a whole series, at some point, I think up 30 companies were working on psychedelics or resistant depression. And just last year, a One Compass Pathways published uh, an exact replication of our study with exactly the same dose, which showing that in a, uh, a three-way design with two lower doses, you get similarly powerful antidepressant effects. Uh, and that, I think, was one of the reasons why the Australian TGA decided to go with psilocybin uh, on compassionate grounds for treatment-resistant depression because it is more powerful than any other treatment we have today. So from that point on, we began to ask questions about what other disorders might be characterized by repetitive thought loops, which patients struggle to break. And of course, the classic ones are things like OCD, where people oh, know that it's ridiculous to keep washing their hands, but they can't stop it. Anorexia nervosa the study of which we've nearly finished. Pain syndromes, where people get locked into pain, even though that the, uh, the pain stimulus has disappeared. And now we're moving to addiction. And we're not the first to do that. The, the groups in Johns Hopkins and New Mexico have previously done some rather elegant work using psilocybin for tobacco quitting and also for alcohol use disorder, respectively. And again, you might say it doesn't make a lot of sense. How can you have a drug that treats depression? Uh, and also treats addiction, they're different disorders. And of course, they're different disorders in terms of their symptomatology. But, but when you look at the brain mental processes, they're all disorders in which people get locked into thinking desires. They get shackled to, to either to, to, to desires, like in addiction, or to thought processes, like in depression and OCD. And the ability of psychedelics to profoundly disrupt those thought processes and actually break you free from them for the period of the trip is very likely to be the mechanism by which they work. Just for a few hours in a psilocybin trip, people are actually free of the depressive thoughts. They're often, often going back to 
the origins of the depression, they're re-exploring the, the traumas that led to them, but they're able to think about them differently because they've escaped from those, um, those repetitive ruminations. And then afterwards, they often come out with a, a very different sense of the past. They often reframe their attitude to their trauma. Most people uh, who are depressed have been traumatized, but depression is a very evil disease because it makes people think they're to, they're to blame for their trauma. They're, they're to blame for their feelings. It's due to their faults. And after psychedelics, people can often reframe their thinking and blame the person who actually did the trauma. So one of our patients rather graphically said during my trip, I, I saw my father abusing me. And I realized that was why I was depressed. I've been repressing that memory for all my life. And I was able to say to him, that's it, you've done it. But now I know you've done it and I don't care anymore. And he came out of the trip saying, you know, he's actually got closure and he's been well for the last 10 years. Now, what is particularly interesting about the, the brain imaging is not only that it helped us push research in the direction of, of therapy, but also we can image the brains of people who have been treated with psychedelics for depression. And, and, and that has led us to, to a discovery, which I think is in many ways even more interesting and important than the discovery that you could actually treat depression. Because uh, with philanthropic funding, we were able to do the first head-to-head -head study of a, a psilocybin versus the gold standard antidepressant SSRI called escitalopram. And that study was designed to explore the brain mechanisms. And we had a hypothesis that they would be different. And it turned out that they were very different. It turns out that escitalopram, classic antidepressants, work in the uh, deep in the brain in the limbic system the emotional center uh, and they produce a, bl a, a blunting of emotional reactivity which is um, protective of stress uh, and the analogy i like to use is that uh, what antidepressants do is they they do to the brain what a plaster of paris does to a broken limb the plaster doesn't heal the limb it doesn't heal the bone but it uh, protects the bone so the bone can heal itself and that's what antidepressants do. They, they blunt the, in, the stress, the effects of stress on the emotional centers of the brain, and they allow the brain to heal. And that healing takes three, four, ten weeks or more, and that's because it takes that long for the brain to recover from chronic stress. But by blunting the brain of, of, from stress, they also blunt other emotions. And we showed with this brain imaging work that they blunted the emotions, blunted pleasurable emotions as well. And psilocybin had no impact whatsoever on emotional responses. And these are measured, these are these are measures of brain activity in an fMRI scan of presenting people with images that either are, are fearful or pleasant. If anything, psilocybin made people respond more positively to uh, neutral images. But the other side of the coin is what does psilocybin do? And psilocybin, it turns out, works in a different part of the brain, it works in the cortex the high level thinking parts of the brain. It disrupts uh, the, the segregated activity of the brain and allows the brain to work more flexibly. And in the two studies we did in depression, we imaged both of the imaging we did in both of them, either a day after the first one or three weeks after the second one, we could see that the brains of people uh, were more flexible. Their brain is more able to switch between different um functional states they've escaped from the troughs and the ruminations and that accords remarkably with what patients say they often say it's like my brain has been defragged or i've uh, reformatted my hard drive my, my mind works much more fluently now i'm no longer stuck in a rut and we can see that and the more flexible their brains were either one day after the trip or three weeks after the trip the better their clinical outcome and that's actually amazing to be able to image someone's brain and have an index of recovery uh, and so you know we're rather, rather pleased with that because it does begin to assuage people's anxieties that this is all just some kind of massive placebo effect i don't think it is i think we actually know that these drugs do make people's brains different in a positive way but has that made any difference in the uk no we um in the last 10 years we've not managed to receive any funding 
for our research. It's all done from, by philanthropy. The British government is almost actively avoiding confronting the need to do this research. We, uh, we're in clinical research now, very much behind uh, Australia, who's uh, where they've got the government's funded it, as you've heard already from Wayne. Canada, where the government's funded it, the US, which has a whole, a whole initiative in, in NIH to fund it. And we're still stuck in the rut of believing that drugs are bad and people shouldn't take drugs. So uh, it's disappointing for me. And I just to um, apologize to Wayne for having to come to Australia to get change, but it was so desperate working in Britain that I thought if there was hope we could find somewhere in the world it would actually perhaps begin to think more rationally about these drugs. And Australia seemed to me a real opportunity. So that's why I went and, and, and did what I did there. But I will reassure you that my team are working very closely with the charity in Australia that is providing the, 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 the drugs for these therapies. We, we are devising the methodologies for monitoring patient change and also using a much more sophisticated statistical analysis of the alterations and the outcomes so we can get a much clearer and more rapid assessment of whether this, uh, this new initiative in Australia works. So I'll stop there and hand over to the next speaker. Great. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nutt. Uh, next up, we're going to the Netherlands, where we have uh, Dr. Margriet van Laar, who is the head of the Drug Monitoring and Policy Devel uh, Department at the Trimbos Institute. And she also serves as the Dutch National Focal Point uh, of the European Monitoring Center for Drugs and Drug Addiction. Dr. van Laar, I turn it over to you. Oh. Okay. Thank you both for introducing me uh, to this uh, webinar on a topic that uh, received quite a lot of attention in Dutch media uh, and politics uh, in the past years. And I have no conflict of interest and uh, the EMC, the, uh, the Trimbos Institute is a Dutch focal point for the European Monitoring Center on Drugs and Drug Addiction uh, in Lisbon. You've asked me to give a brief overview of uh, drug policy in the Netherlands, especially with regard to psychedelics. And um, before I uh, go ahead, I um, would like to mention the distinction between classic psychedelics and atypical psychedelics. And if I am talking about psychedelics in general, I mean um, uh, psilocybin, but um, also MDMA and ketamine, which belong to the uh, atypical uh, psychedelics. And with regard to uh, Dutch drug policy, um, like in most countries, the possession, sale and production of drugs is prohibited. But in the Netherlands, the use of illicit drugs itself is not a criminal offense. And this is done to avoid marginalization uh, of users and facilitate access to services and allow all kinds of harm reduction services like drug checking and drug consumption rooms. And the possession of small quantities of drugs for personal use has a very low priority in investigation and prosecution policy. So if you are uh, caught with uh, one ecstasy pill at a party, um, it will be seized, but you will not get a criminal record. And of course, the sale of cannabis in the Netherlands is uh, tolerated. Um, it is a very low uh, priority or in fact, uh, no priority. But cannabis is not legal, but uh, nowadays an experiment with legally produced cannabis is being conducted and we call it a controlled cannabis supply chain experiment. And with regard to the Dutch drug law, um, we have the Opium Act, which consists of two schedules. And while well, most psychedelics are listed on Schedule 1, which contains drugs posing an unacceptable risk um, to users and society. And there has been a debate for several years whether this classification is justified for MDMA. Then we have Schedule 2 which contains the psilocybin mushrooms, which pose a less serious risk to users and society. And uh, we also have the Dutch Medicines Act. And in 2019, escadamine nasal spray was approved as medication in the treatment of 
uh, treatment-resistant depression symptoms. We also have psilocybin truffles. They are, in fact, legal. I will come back to this issue later. And we have the new uh, psychoactive substances that are uncontrolled. Uh, if I return to the status of magic mushrooms, um, almost 15 years ago, in 2007, there were several serious and sometimes fatal emergencies, often involving drug tourists who visited Amsterdam, where at that time, uh, fresh magic mushrooms were legal and widely available. And one of these cases involved the death of a young girl who jumped from a building. And the use of magic mushrooms has never been toxicological uh, confirmed. And according to the police, there were family and relational problems. But following these emergencies, politicians called for stricter rules. And there was also international pressure uh, to act. And the Coordination Center for the Assessment and Monitoring of New Drugs commissioned, uh, uh, carried out risk assessments on magic mushrooms two times in 2000 and 2007, commissioned by the Dutch Ministry of Health, Welfare and Sports. And overall, the risks were judge, judged to be low. And in fact, this coordination point advised against the ban on magic mushrooms. However, one year later, 186 psilocybin-containing mushrooms were listed on Schedule 2 of the Dutch Opium Act. But what about psilocybin truffles? Well, in fact, both mushrooms and truffles con contain psilocybin. However, truffles aren't mushrooms. Truffles are sclerotia. Uh, they grow under the ground and they are legal. Um, in fact, this was an omission at that time. They just forgot to include them um, on Schedule 2 of the Opium Act. Um, but after uh, that period, after 2008, nobody complained, nobody talked about it. And now uh, the uh, sclerotia are sold in uh, so-called smart shops that are retail establishments specialized in the sale of uh, legal psychoactive substances, usually inclu including uh, natural psychedelics, and they also uh, sell quite some other uh, stuff like paraphernalia and uh, literature. And there are some 120 20 smart shops in the Netherlands. And here you can see what they all, uh, all sell, all kinds of products and vitamins and uh, the truffles. And in fact, they also... Uh, sell grow kits for growing your um, uh, mushrooms. But whenever the mushrooms are growing, and um, at that time they are uh, illegal and uh, because they belong to Schedule 2. Well, if you turn to psychedelic drug research, you've seen in the past years quite a lot of positive media attention and we can witness groups of very enthusiastic and sometimes personally involved researchers. But there are also some recent critical voices of scientists who warn for current medical claims that are unproven and also the risk that vulnerable populations may self-medicate these drugs in uncontrolled settings. It seems like balancing between hype and hope. And currently, there are several research groups, mainly universities involved in research um, in this field. And as, you told, as I told you, ketamine, ketamine has already been approved as a drug for treatment-resistant depression. Uh, psychotherapy with MDMA and psilocybin uh, have not yet been approved. But our Minister of Health is very positive about the future of um, research in, on psychedelics in the Netherlands. He wants to get a kind of pioneering role. And we have a research program on mental health, which may also include research uh, into psychedelics. And then there is a very recent development. On the 17th of March of this year, a state commission on MDMA has been installed to investigate the status of MDMA in the context of public health and to give advice on the pros and cons of medicinal use of MDMA. 
And I know that there are several groups who believe that the scope of this commission is not only on medicinal use, but may also involve the wider status of MDMA or ecstasy in, in, in a broader sense. And here you can see our Minister of Health, uh, Ernst Kuipers, who recently received a report on the therapeutic use of psychedelics funded by the Netherlands Organization for Health Research and Development. And it describes opportunities, challenges, and healthcare innovation for treatment-resistant psychiatric disorders. And I think it is a very good report, which clearly describes gaps in knowledge and all kinds of challenges, as well options for a comprehensive research and implementation program on psychedelics. And well, it addresses, for example, all kinds of financial, regulatory and ethical issues and quality control and so on. Well, that's, these are exciting times in the Netherlands in this field, and I will now try to skip my presentation. <laughs> this is correct. Yes. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Venlar, and I, I want to thank all of our speakers again. Um, so uh, now we're uh, going to do the moderated uh, Q&A. So we still have time. So for uh, for those who are watching, if you have any questions, uh, please post them uh, uh, to Zoom. Um, I want to begin uh, just talking about uh, just how quickly things are changing here in the United States where I'm based. Uh, you know, over the past four years, we've seen more than a you know, more than a dozen cities have deprioritized. Uh, enforcing the law against certain uh, uh, psychedelic laws. You know, we've got uh, ballot initiatives in uh, Oregon and Colorado that passed, uh, which will essentially set up licensed healing or psilocybin service centers. I know that uh, Oregon is uh, um, in the process of accepting licenses right now. Uh, what may have uh, flown under the radar for some people is in Colorado, they not only um, are creating these centers, but they also uh, made it lawful to possess, cultivate, and share five different plant-based uh, psychedelics uh, for uh, adults 21 and older. And this has all happened within the past four years. And I think now there may be you know, over 10 states that are considering legislation. Um, I'm not sure if it's gonna pass in all of those, but I suspect we're going to see more states kind of moving in this direction. And so in some ways, this is very similar to what we saw with cannabis here in the U.S., um, but in some ways, it's, it's a bit different, and, and especially in terms of how quickly things are changing. So one of the questions I wanted to pose to the panel is, you know, what are your thoughts about kind of what you're seeing with respect to psychedelic policy and the research, and how does it compare to what you saw with cannabis? Easy for me to answer that because... We, we're just as backward on cannabis as we are on psychedelics. <laughs> I mean, we we are. This is this is truly an amazing fact. We've had medical cannabis in the UK for four and a half years, and there are only four prescriptions on the NHS. And that tells you something about the problem of socialized medicine, because if, if social, if, if the, the overseers of socialized medicine do not believe in something, it doesn't get used. And it is truly one of the great wasted opportunities in medicine. I mean, it's, uh, I find it actually chilling how we have not made advances there. And, and I, I foresee the same problems with psychedelics. The NHS is a very Stalinist organization. It could actually stop any novelty at all if it chooses to. I can say in Canada, we um, medical cannabis was available in Canada in 2001. And that came apart again by a Supreme Court challenge. And unfortunately, what happens in Canada a lot of the times is we have to go to the courts. We have to go to a Supreme Court challenge to get these. So in 2001, cannabis was available for medically, and then it was legalized across Canada in 2018 for all Canadians. And so uh, what and what we're seeing right now, when I mentioned the Nanos poll that shows 70, 78 to 80% of Canadians support psilocybin at end of life, this is actually a higher percentage 
than there was for support of legalizing cannabis at the time we legalized it, which was more in the 70%. So sometimes you have to just go to the courts. And I think in the US, you're lucky in that in some, in many states, you can have your ballot initiative. And so the ballot initiative forces the hand and the politicians don't stick their neck out on it. They just say, oh, the will of the people have spoken. So that's the same thing what happens in Canada with the courts is that people, is that the politicians can say, the courts have spoken, we must listen. Mm. Uh, I just sort of talk about Australia. Um, I understand David's frustration with the UK. We started off with very much the same program, uh, fairly restrictive. But I think we've now notched up about a quarter of a million prescriptions. Uh, I think largely because of the development of a very large for-profit sector of medical cannabis clinics that probably have never seen a patient who wouldn't benefit from a prescription. Uh, and there's a lot of promotion of medical cannabis for all sorts of uses where there's no evidence base at all. Uh, so I think that's the downside of pharmaceutical policy by plebiscite, um, which seems to be popular in the US. Of course, you'd have hydroxychloroquine and uh, ivermectin uh, also uh, available. You've got Republican states are forcing that on hospitals. So there's a downside to sort of putting it to the vote and letting popularity decide. It's not always well-based. We have a few questions in the uh, in the chat about uh, religious exceptions. And so I don't know to what extent in Canada or in the Netherlands or in the UK or Australia that there may be uh, religious exceptions uh, for using some psychedelics. We don't have any. In fact, we've okay. debarred it. There was a legal attempt to, for the one of the Brazilian churches, and then we we didn't allow it. So I mean, there's only one true religion, and that's Anglicanism. Didn't you know that? <laughs> <laughs> We've had a, in, in Canada, there is a bit of a history of it. We do have an ayahuasca uh, church with a number of uh, places in Canada that have been going for quite a long time. Uh, Dr. Jessica Rochester is one of the reverends that is involved with that, and, and there's many others. Um, and also we're finding that, you know, with UNDRIP, the United Nations uh, Rights of Indigenous Persons to Carry Their Medicine, that actually for, for many First Nations folks are finding it very easy to carry their medicines back and forth across the Canadian-U.S. border. And so uh, the rights of Indigenous persons seem to be being respected, at least at border crossings, which is, is promising. And then I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of ceremony that is going, going on right now within uh, First Nations peoples and First Nations communities in Canada with them just exercising their right to have access to their medicines of choice. Mm -hmm. Yes, and in the Netherlands, we had an exception also on religious grounds for ayahuasca, but this was uh, withdrawn a couple of years ago. Um, but we do have, of course, the, uh, the magic truffles, they are legal. And what we see is that there are a lot of retreat centers where people can uh, use uh, well uh, psychedelic truffles for well all kinds of spiritual purposes and for personal growth and and uh, whatsoever. But this is in fact it is legal because psychedelic uh, truffles are legal in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's become a the Netherlands it's become a huge uh, industry in the Netherlands. If any U UK doctors or Psychologists who want to experience um, psychedelic, uh, the effect, effect of psychedelics, we just recommend they go to the Netherlands because it's uh, at least they don't get a criminal record if they get caught in the UK. I don't know if it's a huge industry, but there, uh, yes, we do know that there are, there's an increasing number of centers where you can uh, get this kind of therapy. Well, it's not formal therapy, of course. Yeah. It's not a charity, let's put it that way. No, that's <laughs> yeah. It's commercialized, yeah. We have another question here uh, about microdosing. Uh, so does anyone care to speak about uh, what the research says or doesn't say about microdosing various psychedelics? Well, we published, the, I think, which is the best paper on microdosing last year in eLife. We did a very clever blinding it was, it was community 
public science experiments, it's quite difficult to do microdosing studies properly because the drugs are illegal. So yeah, you have to bring people in the hospital to administer it, and that's very expensive. So we we do we but we managed to blind people doing their own microdosing using a, a, a rather sophisticated um, procedure. And, uh, and we show that microdosing works, provided you think you're taking it. But if you if you think it's placebo, it doesn't work. And similarly, if if you think placebo is microdosing, it works. If you think placebo is placebo, it doesn't. So the expectation seems to be the dominant uh, driver of microdosing effects. But that was only for a short period. It might be that longer periods of microdosing, maybe over weeks or months, would actually end up giving you um, some more significant effects. In fact, I think Wayne might know that there's a company in Australia called Woke Pharma that is actually doing a microdosing study in depression. And that'll be very interesting to see how that pans out. That's yeah, I, heard, I, I don't know much about it. Though, so. I'll jump in on this too. I think I've done, we've done a mouse of literature and we've been keeping up on all the data on this. And the reality is, is that nobody's really done a really fully proper microdosing study. We've, we've replicated a number of them, but really for the duration that people microdose and on the schedule that people microdose and at the and at a validated uh, medicine, like that's the issue right now is people are procuring their own uh, medicines out there that are not tested. So, I mean, they could be psilocybin that's two years old and has lost its potency. And um, it also is as people microdose in multiple, multiple different different ways. For instance, uh, in the microdose.me data, we've been following many, many, many groups and meeting with them regularly. And, you know, some of the women that are microdosing around premenstrual dysphoria, you know, they may only microdose for five days out of the month and that's it. That's all they need. So nobody's actually done that study. And one of the clinical trials that's trying to replicate it here in Canada, the first dose has to be done in a physician's office where you have to sit there for five hours on a microdose. I mean, that doesn't replicate the real world at all. And so... Uh, I, I really look forward to seeing some of these studies because I have thousands and thousands of case reports of people that are sending in their videos for different um, neurodegenerative uh, conditions and saying, here's my husband before his microdose and here's him after his microdose. And so there's some pretty convincing stuff that we're seeing. And yes, we absolutely need solid, robust clinical trials but we haven't, I, I don't think we've seen those solid, robust clinical trials yet on a standardized dosing range, figuring out what is exactly the dose range, what is exactly the frequency, and what is exactly the duration of that, and for what clinical indications. So we're not there yet, but I think it, it's one of the biggest world's uh, experiment going on right now all over the world. People are microdosing without robust clinical evidence yet. Actually, Dr. Crisco, I want to ask a little bit more about that. So in terms of the reports that you're getting, is it mostly people uh, microdosing psilocybin or are there, you know, uh, other psychedelics as well? We're seeing it with, uh, you know, mostly it's LSD and psilocybin. And okay. then and then we do have a pretty robust um, case reports of ayahuasca and wachuma, more mostly in South America, where people are taking very, 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 very small amounts for that and, and for all over the place indications, like not, not from, from mood and mental health indications, but also for creativity and also for ADHD, ADD, for premenstrual symptoms, traumatic brain injury. I mean, it's, it's just really, it's really um, ripe for solid science. Like there's just so many targets here that I think we'll be researching this forever. I mean, microdosing is a little bit like I was saying, a bit, a bit like cannabis, you know, it you you can justify using it for everything, but there's almost no evidence it works for anything. But it does seem to be safe anyway. That's good. Well, more accurately, the evidence hasn't been done yet. Would be a more accurate statement is that the clinical trials haven't been done. No, not so. And they may never be done, to be honest, because it's hard to me to see how you're gonna you're ever gonna commercialize it. So I don't really find I don't see. So I think it's going to be one of those things where it's. It's like many health supplements, people use them and they think they're useful, but um, who, who will know? But I mean, I don't, as I say, at least they're not going to be harmful and it might be, it might be great. I don't know. Well, that's a call out to public funding, really. That's why we need our, our governments to be putting money into research so that we can actually research these things because our patients are using them. 
And so it behoves us to, to actually do this, this research is, as harm reduction and to scientists and researchers, we should be studying and finding out the evidence. I would agree. Yeah. Dr. Holland mentioned that uh, they're projecting that it could cost up to 15,000 US dollars per treatment in Australia. And uh, I know that they're running, they're, in, in Oregon, they're trying to figure out for the, the licensing centers, trying to figure out a way to um, um, you know, make it more available to those um, who may not have the, uh, the, the funds. And so, uh, so, so Dr. Nutt, in the research that you do, you know, what is, what, what is involved in terms of the, the number of uh, clinicians you may have during a session? And what do you think about the costs uh, as well as ways to potentially reduce them? Well, the first thing I'd say is I don't think that, I don't think that's expensive at all. <laughs> that's less than the cost of a hernia operation and taking yourself from severe depression to a state where you're functioning and back to work is economically enormously valuable. So we, we, we're in the, we've been doing an analysis uh, of the um, cost benefits of the, the cytosidin versus escitalopram in the trial we did. Uh, that's under review at present. Yes, I mean, it's, a, it, we think certainly from a period, after about over th about three years, psychedelic therapy is going to be better and more cost effective than standard um, SSRI therapy. I think in America, in the USA, it won't take that long because I, I was horrified to discover last week that the majority of prescriptions for antidepressants in the veteran system in the States, they're still using the... Um, non-generic so the original formulations which are way more expensive than generic formulations so actually it might only it might only be the, the same as a year's cost of an, of an antidepressant in the state so so i think actually they are pretty cost effective and you and you could bring the prices down we use we have two therapists but you could probably get away with one some people mm -hmm. consider using group therapy which is okay if you want to be in a group not everyone does but so i think you could probably bring it out in the uk we're offering um, a, a course of ketamine treatment for about six thousand pounds, about eight thousand, nine thousand dollars, which is actually, I think, you know, remarkably good value because I spent uh, sixteen thousand pounds on a, a new knee, and a new brain is definitely more use than a new knee. <laughs> I can give you some of our Canadian numbers um, for our psilocybin therapy for our patients at our end of life. We do all group therapy, and it's exactly that we're trying to fill in the research gaps around access. Um, and we can't, we don't think psychedelics can be a have and have not situation. It, you shouldn't have to be wealthy to have access to psychedelics. So we're really looking at the group therapy and studying that and publishing on that. And our psilocybin in Canada, so Canadian dollars, is about a $4,000 cost to the patient. And our um, uh, three uh, three psychedelic sessions is probably going to be closer to about six six to eight. $8,000 Canadian, and we're working on that to bring that, that price down a lot. But um, going to what Dr. Nutt said, though, the, what policymakers need to understand is uh, the enormous amount of cost savings to the system. So we in British Columbia have population data, and we were able to do um, a head-to-head -head comparison with patients that come in our psychedelic program uh, to people that don't. And so all we could look at was just depression. And what we found is that for every single patient that goes to our 12 week program at a cost of $6,000, we save the healthcare system $30,000 if they only have depression. Most of our patients have multiple com comorbidities. They have PTSD, they have anxiety, they have grief, maybe suicidal ideation, disordered eating, substance use challenges. So if, if there was any way which our health economist assures us it's not even possible to crunch those numbers, but if we save thirty thousand dollars per participant, that should make policy maker like people that are funding national health care or private health care or insurers in the U.S. This is a no brainer. This is a massive cost savings, and plus people. And it's not even just the cost savings to the healthcare system. It's the cost savings to people's families and their children and their communities and where they work. So the savings is enormous. And one more question uh, about the uh, uh, about the cost, uh, Dr. Hall. There's a question for you asking about whether or not these treatments in Australia 
will be covered under Medicare or PBS publicly funded, or will it be individually and privately funded? Well, it'll be individually privately funded until they've been approved as medicines. The process in Australia would require the TGA to approve them for medical use in a separate process, which would decide whether they were cost effective treatments or not. And I take David's point, if the trial results hold up in, in uh, more representative samples, then you know, there's a good chance that it will be publicly subsidised, but it won't be at the moment. That just isn't, isn't the data there to support it. Okay. We have another question. Um, I guess you could answer this for your specific country. Um, uh, the viewer asks, how long do you think it will be until psychedelics are commonplace in the treatment of various psychological problems? I guess you can, you can interpret commonplace uh, how you want. <laughs> Uh, well, my, my sort of take would be that, you know, the depression and PTSD are probably first cabs off the rank. And you know, if the results in the phase three trials hold up, um, uh, then it's quite likely that we'd see both of those approved as, uh, as has happened with um, ketamine uh, for depression as well. Uh, for, for other conditions, I think we probably need a bit more evidence, a few more trials. And then the trials are at a much earlier stage for conditions like addiction and OCD and so on. But um, uh, if they are effective in depression, I wouldn't see there any major obstacles to uh, their being introduced into clinical practice, certainly in Australia. What about the Netherlands then, Margaret? Come on. What's your guess about the Netherlands? Well, I think it's it's most likely, well, ketamine has been registered already, but there's now, um, well, there are several uh, groups focusing on MDMA, and I think MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder, um, well, might be very likely to be registered in, uh, well, in the future, I <laughs> I can't look in, in, in a... In the future, but uh, whether uh, how many years that uh, may may still take. But what I can see is now that uh, that really our Minister of Health is very much in favor of um, the mental health care innovation. So now they want to set up real proper trials, programs, and so on, and uh, also uh, create uh, the, the conditions and. Uh, um, look for regular, regulatory frameworks and so on. Uh, but I also do know that in the Netherlands, they do want uh, to, to, well, they uh, like to do it very properly and carefully, uh, step by step and a bit cautious. And I think that's good. It should be, um, well, if... It, it may take a bit longer than than perhaps many people would like uh, to to take, but I think steps have been set. Also, with the state committee and, and the report that was recently uh, be published. I, well, it's written in Dutch, but uh, uh, I can really uh, suggest uh, you to read it and uh, use it in uh, in a translator. Um, it really gives solutions for current problems and uh, argues for a, a research, uh, coordinated research program. So I think it's very likely that it will happen, but the pace and how, well, it may take, take some time. Yeah. Well, can I, can I ask you to do it as fast as possible because we're gonna to have to send patients to you because I think you're gonna achieve it before we do. I think in Canada, just jumping in for that part, your answer is uh, we should see MDMA legal here next year, I suspect, based on the MAPS MDMA trials for PTSD, at least for that indication. Mm -hmm. And depending, um, you know, what happens federally, we could see it. We could see psilocybin. I mean, we already have access to it under special access. So mm -hmm. essentially, we have access, but just not um, at that ease. But the other thing to keep in mind, I'm totally all for clinical trials and safety and doing this, but we have to remember patients have access to this right now, online, everywhere. And so us moving 
too slow is not serving the patients at all. All of our patients right now can work with an underground therapist. I would rather that they're working with a regulated therapist. It, it, like this is the thing about going slow and deliberately. Maybe we need to speed it up. Maybe we need to put a lot of money into these trials and move things along because people have access to this. I just can't emphasize that enough. But we're not getting in the way. This is not a molecule in the lab. They have access to this. And we have a public duty to get the data out there and show up and lead this as professionals. And the policymakers and the po politicians need to speed up on this. We cannot go at this slow pace. We have researchers in all of our countries that would love to be doing this research. Um, and it needs to be funded. So I'm an advocate for moving a lot faster on this. I mean, it's a harm reduction thing. Like we're not stopping people from having access to this medicine. Slow is not better here. It actually uh, leads to a nice transition to this question that we just received um, asking the panelists. So whether or not you think uh, that there's a risk of over-medicalizing psychedelics. I don't know what over-medicalizing means. Could, could that person explain what that means? You mean making them just medicines? As you uh, mean, I, I, I think the question is largely about, you know, having most of the focus be on, on, on the medical side versus potentially, you know, on, on, more on, you know, on the religious or spiritual side. Uh, well, yeah. Yes. Well, as a doctor, it's easier for me to talk about medical things. I mm -hmm. you know, I'm quite happy for pastors and religious leaders and talk about the others but i think there's a danger i don't i i the previous generation of psychedelic research was was somewhat uh, um undermined by scientists moving beyond their area of expertise i don't i don't want to do that i want to stick <laughs> to what yeah I love this question. I think this is really, I think all options should be on the table. I think from spirituality to creativity to, uh, you know, religious use and to the medical, shouldn't all options, they're not exclusive. We should be able to have access. And right now in the underground, people have access to it for their spiritual and their their creativity. And so I don't, I don't think if we can add more data, it, it's not exclusive, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, physicians are not just science, like we're also people too. We're also musicians and artists and 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 scientists it's not mutually exclusive so i like the question but i think all options are on the table and i certainly think humans have the right to their own consciousness to do what they want to do if they want to use these mind-altering medicines i wouldn't dispute that at all absolutely i mean we said you should decriminalize the use of all drugs obviously but but i'm i'm cautious as a doctor to be promoting areas that i don't have competence in and you might, I don't. <laughs> but it might be a consequence of medical treatment in the long term. How, how do you mean? It might, if, if, if um, MDMA is embedded in the treatment system, well, it might have an impact on risk perception or the way how people look at drugs and well well boundaries may become more fuzzy i don't know yeah i don't know i think it might have the opposite it might make it unfashionable outside of medicine that could be a very interesting preventive measure when, you, when your parents are taking it for their marital disharmony, the kids aren't going to want to be taking it in the clubs. Okay. Yeah. That's a good one. Good point. <laughs> Dr. Hall, did you have anything to say on this? Yeah, I mean, I just sort of make the point that medicalization was, was clearly the strategy uh, pursued to legalize cannabis in the U.S., uh, and uh, I don't think that example has been lost on uh, people in the psychedelic movement who are wanting to uh, liberalize access to it. And in fact, if you read some of the, the history of some of the people behind the philanthropists behind funding trials of MDMA and psilocybin, their, their agenda is very much the, to get it legalized for medical use uh, and to then liberalize the law more generally to allow its uh, use for non-medical purposes. Uh, I guess, as I said earlier in, in my introduction, that 
having lived through the earlier enthusiasm, once these drugs get out of the wild, as I agree with Pamela, they already are, uh, then there's the risk of, um, of people being harmed uh, if they're used inappropriately by unethical practitioners, uh, whether they be purporting to be religious leaders or medical practitioners. And I think, yeah, there's always the risk if we had enough of those sorts of casualties that you know, we can see restrictions of the sort that Margaret talked about in the Netherlands that followed the death of that young woman uh, who may or may not have taken psilocybin. Our last question, um, one of the viewers asks, uh, uh, can psilocybin help people who are living with Alzheimer's or, uh, or dealing with other forms of dementia? Has there been much research on that? Well, I'll say something that I do know, and then maybe Pamela will talk more about her anecdotes. But so some of my team were part of a study which was cut about four years ago uh, using a, what's called a midi dose of LSD so 10 micrograms of LSD in people with age-related memory impairment. And uh, they were administered, they were given LSD twice a week, uh, I think for six weeks. Uh, and um, it didn't actually have any impact on their cognitions, um, but it did improve their mood. Uh, and it might be if you pushed it longer, you would get an effect on cognitions, or it might be you wouldn't improve cognition, but it might prevent a decay over time but those trials are extraordinarily expensive and complex to do. So it'll be a long time before we've actually got good data on that. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I, I think they're, they're very expensive trials. They're very, they're much needed. And the anecdotal evidence, of course, is anecdotal. Um, you know, whether it's working or not, a lot of my patients will come back and say they notice their word finding is much better um if they're if they're doing something like microdosing but again that's not that's anecdotal you know we, we need those clinical trials and they're expensive and we're going to need good funding to do it and if if we do find something that it helps with this well that would be fantastic wouldn't it <laughs> so it, it seems I like mean, a worthy thing to study it is that that recent stamets uh online study where he looked at a, a combination of psilocybin and lion's mane mushrooms and the tibet took psilocybin did Elderly people who took psilocybin did seem to be, they did seem to improve their, one of their numeric cognitive uh, abilities. So yeah, yeah, that was, yeah, it was not, yeah, it was not, I mean, it was a, a, the best we can do at present without investing huge amounts of money, get people to buy their own stuff and then do the tests online. It, it was a clever approach and, and it was, mm -hmm. you know, not overwhelming, but certainly interesting and likely, to, you know, potentially true. Yeah. So it sounds like this is very much an area uh, where we definitely need more clinical research. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, that, uh, well, Wayne, Marguerite, Pamela, Dave, I just want to thank you for taking the time and sharing your experiences and your insights. Uh, I learned I, I learned a tremendous amount, and I'm sure our viewers did too. For all those, uh, for all of you watching, you know, thank you very much uh, for taking the time, and also for, especially to those uh, who submitted questions. Um, as Carmel mentioned at the beginning, this is just the first of three seminars, uh, so uh, very soon we will be uh, putting out an advertisement for our webinar on uh, psychedelics in the global south, and then probably a month after that we'll have one all focused on psychedelics and in, uh, indigenous communities. So with that, I just want to thank you again and. Uh, um, and I hope to see you uh, during the next session. Take care. Thanks, everyone.